you see that sometimes we can see a large sample <coughs> standing in for a population. Okay, so probability, as I mentioned here earlier, a little bit was the area under the relative frequency distribution. Because that area is equal to one, the total area, we can take fractions of that area and that directly relates to probability. So the probability that the number of dice is 1.2 is as I showed you that shaded area over there, that fractional area. So again, some of the concepts are very comfortable from the school and from earlier undergraduate courses. Let's take a look at some other concepts that you should be familiar with. Parameters and statistics. Parameters are a value that we say describes the population. So let's take as an example the income from all of Canada, we had said last class, if we had the income data for all of Canada, we plotted it, we might likely see something like this with peak and then a very long tail down over here. So we're plotting income earned in dollars on that axis. And the good axis is the fraction. So this total area is equal to 1. <coughs> so that's a population. If we have that information, that's a population. And so we can then quantify that curve in some way. We can say the maximum value of the sorry, the, the, the high, let's not say the maximum, the, the greatest frequency observed, in other words, that number over there, let's say it corresponds to $30,000, I can say. That's a parameter that quantifies that distribution. That's the, the peak frequency. Let's say the median, the median is over here. So we'll talk about the median in a minute. Let's say the median is 33000 That median then of 33000 is a parameter. It's a number from the population. The statistic, on the other hand, is a number that comes from estimating that parameter. So if we don't have the population available to us many times, we usually only have a subset of the data available. So a statistic then is an estimate of that parameter. So we estimate or try to get a close approximation that this will be our most usual situation. We recognize that access to the population data is impossible costly. So how can we estimate that parameter from the population distribution? So a lot of confidence intervals discussion next week will be around estimating statistics. Because we know we cannot ever get to the population. So it's a minor distinction that might not seem to be too important to you, but parameters come from population, statistics come from sample. <coughs> the next population parameter we're going to consider is the mean. The mean is defined simply by this curly E operator. So if you go look at statistics textbooks, so they're filled with this sort of notation. This expectation operator, the expectation of a variable x. What is the expected value of observing a variable x? So for example, if x is the yield from your batch reactor to max polito, what is the expected value of that yield? It's the mean. It's a measurement of location. Why do we say it's a measurement of location or position? It's telling us where along this axis are we located? <coughs> what is our expected, expected value along that axis? What is our position along that axis? And the expectation operator is defined. This is a definition. And shorthand for it is the symbol for U. So U is simply just shorthand for saying the same thing over there. And the definition of that mean is sum of all possible values that you and divide through by n the number of entries in your population. Now we could be 
don't have access to our population and when it gets to do that estimate statistic instead. So mu is my parameter, x bar is my statistic. And it's the sample mean. So that sample mean x bar or that statistic x bar is calculated by simply creating an approximation to that where we go take a sample from the population and our sample size is lowercase n. So lowercase n is my sample size. So I sum them up and divide them by lowercase n. where we go and say 
x minus mu, that sort of operation of subtracting the mean we call centering. So we're going to hear a lot about centering over the next 8 to 10 weeks, where we simply just take away our mean. There's a good reason for us doing that. The mean is often uninteresting. Once you know what the mean is, you know what it is. Okay? We like to work in terms of deviations from the mean. Those numbers then are, become a lot easier to work with, and the scale of, that, of those numbers becomes a lot easier. So centering is something we're going to do very frequently in this course. So we center our data, we square it, and then we calculate the sum and divide it by n. Now someone had asked me, why do we call this standard deviation? So right in the first week of the course, I asked you to write down some things you wanted to see. And someone asked, I want to know why it's called this standard deviation. And I was like, okay, I never really thought of it, so I looked up, there is no real reason for it being the standard deviation. It's simply a name that was given to it by um, Sir Ari Fisher in the 1920s. He called it standard deviation, and that's the name that's used ever since. So there's, no, there's nothing standard about it, it's not like standard kilogram or some the standard of some sort, it's simply just a name. Okay. Now, the population variance, sigma squared is not computable in many cases. You cannot find it. So you will take a sample of data and then estimate it. So there's my parameter now, S squared. And this again bothers people sometimes, is when we do calculate the standard deviation or the variance, we divide it through by n minus 1. And we see in textbooks that we call that the degrees of freedom. Okay, that n minus 1. Okay, so why have we lost one degree of freedom? We've lost one degree of freedom because we've gone to calculate x bar. So x bar, we needed to use our data and to calculate x bar, we pursue a degree of freedom. We're doing that. And then we divide it by n minus 1. Now, that distinction is not important for engineers. If you're a social scientist, or if you're in a case where you're working in a lab with a small number of samples, then that distinction is important. But by and large, for us, in our practical work, divided to by n, divided by n minus 1 is not so we will most commonly just use the convention of n minus 1. But if you go read and re if your research in the future involves what are called small sample statistics, that becomes a big deal. That can cause quite a bit of change in the results. But for our cases, we generally just take it as n minus 1 and leave that convention. Now let's talk about a little bit more interesting material, material that you may not have heard before. How many of you have heard about outliers? Okay. Have you studied outliers and looked at ways of dealing with outliers? Not too much. Yes? Ignore. Okay. So the classic example is you're doing a lab report for Dr. Thompson. There's a value that you don't like, so you delete it. You don't even say anything about it. Okay, so you ignore it, right? So we've all done that sort of thing. Here's why robust statistics are important for you. I want you to start seeing what the advantage of robust statistics are. And I encourage you in your career in the future to use robust statistics. But you will also face some resistance from people when you start to do that. So let's talk about that by an example. So the first problem we encounter with robust statistics and outliers is that there isn't really a good definition for an outlier. This is the best definition I could come up with. An outlier is a point that's unusual given the context of the data that's around here. Okay, so it implies that it's always situation dependent. It depends on the example or the case or the context you're dealing with. So take a look at those two figures, spot the outlier, those two sequences, spot the outlier.
all flags? The first sequence of data could be the 9,552. The second sequence, 4024, very easy to spot. Okay, so notice in the second sequence, the 4024, that number appears in the first sequence as well. In the first sequence, that number is not an outline. In the second sequence, it is an outline. Okay. Indicating to you that it is very much context dependent. So there's no way you can tell what outlines are. You have to have surrounding material to guide you. Okay. Now, if you go into R or um, MATLAB or any of these tools that will calculate statistics for you, you calculate the average of that second sequence of numbers, it will tell you the average is 404. What's, wrong? What's happened over there? Is the average of that second sequence of numbers 404? Right, you consider the outlier. So it's biased in the outputs. So we'll use that terminology. Our, 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 is that a statistical parameter? Statistic. Our X bar statistic has been biased up. Biased up by that parameter. That statistic S, standard deviation, is it being biased up or down? Okay, okay variances are that variance, or, sorry, that standard deviation is much higher than it would otherwise be. Okay. So we need to deal with our outliers effectively. And one way of doing that is to use different statistics. So instead of using means and standard deviations, let's use medians and mads. So median is a robust measure of location. It's an alternative to the mean that's resistant to outliers. In fact, it is the most resistant statistic possible to outliers for calculating the mean. There's no other statistic that you can find that's more robust or more resistant to outliers than the median. The reason why we say that is because you need 50% of your data to be contaminated with outliers before the median will be broke, breaks down. Okay? So 50% plus one data point before that median breaks down. So half your data set needs to be contaminated with outliers before your median becomes an unsuitable estimate of your location. And I'll argue that if half your data set is contaminated, you've got bigger problems than calculating the statistics. Okay? So it's the most resilient form of calculating the location. When you go to any data set in the future, I encourage you in your spreadsheet, in R, or whatever tool you use, to instead of typing average on this column, type median and use that instead. Okay, so what is the median doing? Well, we know know what it's doing. It simply sorts the data from low to high and picks the middle. So we take our vector of data, we sort it from low to high, and we pick that midpoint over there. That's my median. So now if you go to your boss and tell your boss, I calculated the median yield for my process is 28 grams per liter. Your boss says, well, what's the average yield? Like, no, I learned that she calculated the median yield. And your boss said, well, no, tell me the average yield. I don't believe the median. Why are people resistant to using the median? Why do you think people are hesitant? For example, how many reports and uh, literature have you read where people actually use a median instead of a mean? Not too many, right? So why do you think there's that hesitation? I, I think people think the media doesn't tell you that much about the whole set of data in terms of what the spectrum. <coughs> the media doesn't tell you about the whole spectrum of the data. But does the mean tell you anything about the spectrum of the data? Right? <laughs> Same thing, right? It seems a lot more natural to come that the average is more likely to occur. So if the data 
and skew, the median will be a lot different to the average away. Okay, so there's, yeah, there's some good discussion there. Yeah, Kyle. Make um, sure the smaller data set, the average will make more sense. The average makes more sense for a smaller data set. Since you're taking into account all the data points, since you're adding everything up and dividing by everything, it feels as if you're accounting for everything as opposed to looking at one specific point. That's that's a that's a great great one. The others, other points, absolutely also good reasons. But the other, the main reason why people end up hang up about the media is it feels like you've done no work. You've gone and sorted the data and picked one number. You're using one raw value from the data set to summarize it. And that doesn't feel right. Why would you use a raw number to summarize your data set? If you calculate the mean, you feel like you've done, done a lot of computation and you're kind of smearing all your data together to calculate a new value. Okay. You actually have done a lot of work to sort the data. So the computer does a tremendous amount of work to sort the data set. And, but you pick a raw value, it still doesn't feel like you're picking a raw number. That's one reason why people are hesitant. There's a whole lot, as Priya mentioned as well, issues related to the median position versus the means position on skewed distributions. Okay, so if we take a distribution that's heavily skewed like that, the median will lie here and the mean will lie here. So the median may be there and the mean might be over there. Which of those two is a more reflective of the central tendency of the data set? The median, for sure it is. Okay. So by reporting the mean, you're overstating the central tendency of the data set, especially if that tail is very heavily skewed. I've exaggerated a little bit. Those two lines will be a little closer to each other. But the mean will be pushed over and biased upwards. Okay. The mean, we say, will break down with only one bad data point. You only need one outlier before your mean breaks down. Okay, one bad number and that whole data set, that whole statistic is meaningless. Okay, so the mean is not a good parameter of our data set. You should, and I encourage you to use the median going forward for those, for those users. Let's talk about another statistic, the MAD. The MAD is the median absolute deviation. It's a robust measure of spread. Okay? And it's calculated in a very natural way, as you might expect. You take x, your raw data points, subtract the median, subtract <coughs> the average, but then the non resistance to outline. Then what we do is we now have these deviations. So I now have a new vector of data, xi minus the median. So subtract my median, and that leads to a new vector of deviations. And some of these deviations are going to be positive, some are going to be negative. In fact, exactly half will have positive signs and exactly half will have negative signs because of the definition of the Okay, so that means subtraction is going to lead to a new vector of, of data. Take the absolute values of the entries in that vector. Now you have all positive numbers. Okay, so you've got positive numbers that range between zero and some value. Calculate the median of that vector now. So now you're finding that average deviation multiplied by some constant. We call that the median absolute deviation. So we take that word median absolute deviation, work it back, let's calculate the deviations, then the absolute values, then the median, and that's how we unpack this. So, so it's a robust measure of the standard deviation. So whenever you want to use the standard deviation, stop and use the MAD instead. It's a more resistant version of the standard deviation. Now, grad students, you have to read this paper by Rousseau. Rousseau is the god of robust statistics. Absolute genius in this area did a phenomenal amount of work on robust statistics. And this paper, you can read with just 
just even a high school education. It doesn't take a lot. So it's really, really well written and the rest of the classroom also right? Okay, so there's a good description in that paper on the median absolute deviation. He didn't invent it, um, but he talks a lot about those. Now, those are not the only two robust statistics that you can use. There's several others that are out there. Uh, for example, I mentioned in the previous class the interquartile range. The interquartile range is the distance between the first quartile and the third quartile. So if we go back and draw a picture of a histogram, I've got my histogram like this. There's my second quartile. My second quartile is just a fancy way of saying median. Exactly the same thing. Okay, here's my first quartile and here's my third quartile. And this distance between the first and third quartile called the interquartile range or the IQR. So if you calculate the IQR for a data set, that's another way of measuring the spread. Data sets with a small amount of spread, small IQR, they have a large IQR of the spread. So R will do all of these for you. For a given data set, the median, the mad, and the IQR are built-in functions in R. So I'll just show you over here. Um, you type median and tab use the median sample, if you type mad, okay, we'll compute the median absolute deviation. Okay, and notice that constant 1.4826. By default, we'll use a constant of 1.4826. The reason for that constant is so that if you calculate the mag on a normal distribution with that constant 1.4826, you'll get the same value as constant to make the two metrics line up with each other. So that's a standard value that we use. And then IQR, the only difference with IQR to be aware of is don't use lowercase that there's no function lowercase IQR, it's capital IQR. And it's the Yeah, it's 
showed for a finite sample, so those bars are not quite the same height, but a distribution, a theoretical distribution, uh, has bars of equal height. So we're, we're familiar with this sort of um, behavior from these prior courses. What I want to consider more in depth, however, is the central limit theorem and the idea of independence. Because this is something that you've seen before, or may have been confused by, but it is important to understand as we start to look at these squares and design experiments. We're going to build on and require a good understanding of what the central limit theorem is. Okay, so here's what I want you to consider for the central limit theorem. You're standing at your process and measuring the flow rate. That flow rate that you're measuring comes from some sort of population. You don't know what that distribution of that population looks like. But you're taking samples. So I take one sample, let's call it x1. I take another sample of flow rate a few hours later, x2. Another sample of flow rate a few hours later still, that's x3. Each one of those samples that I'm taking are independent of each other. We're going to talk about what it means next. So I've got these samples and I build up this, a vector of them. Let's say n, lowercase n samples. If I calculate the average of those n samples, all the central limit theorem does is it's telling you the average of those n samples, x bar. That x bar value comes from the normal distribution. It's not saying anything about these x values. It simply says calculating x bar from a bunch of samples that are taken independently. If you do that, that new value you compute x bar will be as if it came from the normal distribution. So it seems a little bit weird. Why, why do we care about that and where is this going? But that's the interpretation of the central limit theorem. <coughs> so let's talk about what the average does. And you might start to see what's going on here. The average, recall from a few slides back, says add up numbers and divide through by n. <coughs> So in other words, if we take these independent numbers and add them up, divide through by n, that addition, that sum of those values divided through by n, or we call that mean, is x bar, and that value, x bar, comes from the distribution itself. Why do we say x bar comes from the distribution? Is it x bar fixed? Why am I emphasizing that x bar comes from the distribution? That implies that x bar is varying. So what it says is that there's some normal distribution now. The central limits here, here it says x bar comes from a normal distribution. So here's a normal distribution, and it says x bar comes from this distribution. So it means x bar can be this value, it can be that value, it can be that value x bar is a variable. And because if I go and take another set of data, n points, six days later I go back to my process and measure flow rate 1, flow rate 2, 3, 4, and flow rate n. And I compute the average of those n flow rates a few days later, I'm going to get a different x bar. And if I repeat that process again, I'm going to get yet another x bar. And again, I go repeat and I'll get still another x bar. Every time we're going to get an x bar value. So all the central limit theorem does is it's telling me those x bar values comes from this normal distribution, or any normal distribution. So we're going to use that interpretation and that concept quite frequently in the next two, three classes. And then we're going to derive confidence intervals based on that line of thinking. And then confidence intervals we're going to use squares and DOEs. So this is going to build up over the next few classes. So it's a pretty powerful theorem that we that, that can be derived. And the other interesting thing, there's only one other point we have to bear in mind, that that data must come from a distribution of finite variance. 
in engineering, guarantee every data set you'll deal with comes from a distribution of finite variance. It's only mathematicians and statisticians that deal with distributions of infinite variance. We don't have that. Okay? So we will always satisfy that criteria. The independent samples, that's another story. We actually often violate that assumption. So let's understand what independence means. But before I do that, I just like to illustrate to you what central limit theorem is doing. Central limit theorem says we take data, add it up, and that sum is as it comes from normal distribution. So what I've done over here is if I throw a dice once, so I throw my dice, and I measure the value, it's either going to be a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. There you go. That's a beautiful distribution. Now let me throw my dice twice. Once or twice, I get two different numbers, or I get two numbers. Calculate the average of those two throws. Throw my dice, throw my dice again, measure those two numbers, calculate the average of those two, and if I plot a histogram of those averages successfully doing that, I'm going to get that sort of histogram. Then I throw my dice four times and calculate the average, I'm going to get that sort of histogram. So the average can never exceed 6, we know that. So it's always going to be a number between 1 and 6. But the probability of throwing your dice 4 times and getting 4 1s is very low. 4 6s is like 6, 6, 6, 6. So your average then 6 is very low. The average, the probability of getting 3s, well there's many different ways that you can get an average of 3. But there's only one way that you can get an average of 1, and there's only one way you can get an average of 6, and the probability of getting that is very small. Throw your dice 6 times, 8 times, or 20 times, or 10 times, so that the distribution very rapidly approaches the normal distribution. Okay, so dice, throwing a dice, that comes from a uniform distribution. So this over here, that comes from a uni uniform distribution. Take independent samples. Yes, I am doing that. Throwing the dice is an independent action. Help the average. It's just a frequency. So the number of times I get that.
Okay? You're talking with the person next to you, it's likely that the two of you are writing similar things in your evaluation. And so I'm getting fewer than 100 independent pieces of information back. And I see this all the time, because when I collect evaluations, side by side, I see the same remarks written. So I know this is true. The next one, if we calculate the snowfall recorded in inches for the last 30 days, are those snowfall values independent? So today it snows 5 inches, tomorrow it snows 1 inch, and the next day it snows 0 inches. That 5, 1, 0, those successive numbers are like independent. Yep. Uh, only if it melts, like before the next snowfall, right? Okay. Only if it melts before the next snowfall? Yeah. It's not independent. Why is it not independent? Every sample impacts the next one. Is it independent? Okay, so let's take a look what independent says. It says if two samples are independent, there's no possible relationship. Why is that true or not true? Think about it as you can talk about it. 